Thanks, Matt. And uh, thanks for inviting me today. Oak Quilt is a topic that I very much enjoy talking about. Um, and I'm going to start off right now by putting all rumors to rest. Rumors have been circulating around Minnesota for a long time now. Yes, this is my first webinar. <laughs> so, um, I, was, I was happy to be asked to talk about this topic because um, last year, Oakwell's incidence and severity was higher than normal. And Burr Oak Blight, also for the last several years in the upper Midwest, has been getting a lot of press. And so I feel like there's ample room for confusion for Minnesotans when they see all these uh, press releases on Burrow Blight, and then they see oak wilt all over the landscape and two-line chestnut bore over the, all over the landscape. I think there's a lot of confusion out there, so I'm happy to talk about this topic today. Um, but before I get started, um, I just want to advertise this USDA publication. Uh, it, where it reviews eight common diseases of oaks. It's a fantastic publication. It, it's kind of in table format, has good pictures, good text descriptions of these diseases. And I highly recommend getting your hands on that. And I believe Matt Russell has put a link to that publication on the My Minnesota website, My Minnesota Woods website. So check that out. I'm going to start off talking about oak wilt. Here's a shot of oak wilt. Um, Oak wilt creates mortality centers or disease pockets, and it can do so contrary to popular belief in pretty high quality oak stands like this image shows. Um, and I'll, I'll start off by saying that there is very um, strong evidence that oak wilt is a non-native species. I know a lot of the time when I'm talking about oak wilt, people, people bring up the fact that it's been here a long time and it's it, it hasn't spread across the landscape at the rate of, say, a chestnut blight or a Dutch elm disease, but the genetic profile of the, pat, of the oak wilt um, pathogen isolates that they've studied show limited diversity, which suggests it's a non-native. And also, when you take a look at host susceptibility to oak wilt, um, there's limited to no evidence that there's any resistance whatsoever, any resistance whatsoever in, our northern, in our red oak species. Where is oak wilt? Oak wilt is here. The red dots show where we know oak wilt has been confirmed in the past. Um, certainly, there are more, there's more oak wilt on the landscape than what this map shows. Um, but, and, and just this morning, I quickly put up the dates of, of locations of oak wilt. So you can see in the early 50s, oak wilt was confirmed in White Bear Lake. It was likely there well before that. Um, in 2000, it was, it was confirmed in Pine County. Again, oak wilt is a non-native species, and, and um, the likelihood of finding uh, an introduced species in a new area, just the initial find, the, the initial introduction, the chances that you have of finding that are very, very, very low. So I suggest to people, when you find oak wilt in a spot, um, that has not been confirmed to have oak wilt before, say, 100 miles from the nearest known spot, I, I recommend that people suspect that it is much wider spread than that. So if you have one introduction that you know of, you should think, well, we probably have 10 that we are unaware of. Oak wilt is a very tricky organism to identify in aerial surveys at low levels. Um, if you, and I, I'll also um, ask that if you think you found oak wilt in, in a previously unconfirmed county, um, please get that oak wilt confirmed somehow. Um, one way is through the University of Minnesota Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab. And um, when you send in samples, they have to be to a lab. They have, have to be actively wilting. They cannot be dead. You cannot send in a, a um, leafless branch. Um, you want to send in, you want to keep samples cool overnight because the oak wilt pathogen perishes at about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you want to increase your likelihood of getting a positive in a sample that actually does have the pathogen in it, you want to ship it overnight. Um, faults, faults, negatives are not uncommon with oak wilt testing, and it's not the lab's fault, and it's not always the collector's fault. It's the pathogen in a given tree that has the, 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 the disease is not in all parts of that tree. 
it's only in some parts of it. Okay, so I, I kind of already mentioned this. The opal pathogen kills all of our native oaks. In the literature, you oftentimes see um, it's stated that white oaks and bur oaks are not as susceptible to oak wilt as red oaks. That's, that statement is a little misleading because an oak wilt that has a wound in, in May and a red oak that has a wound in May, they, and they're, if they're right next to each other, they probably have an equal chance at being infected by oak wilt. That it's just that oak wilt proceeds much more slowly in white oaks and bur oaks than it does in the red oak group. Now, I'll, I'll hit on that a little bit more. Let's, let's talk about recognition right now. Oak, look at oak wilt recognition on red oaks is relatively easy compared to white oaks and red oaks because there aren't many other things um, that, that do to a northern red oak what oak wilt does. So the first thing that you'll notice, well, you'll, you'll actually notice a bronzing in the canopy quickly followed by leaf cast or leaf shed that is rapid and drastic. And the leaves that fall to the ground, um, some of them are going to be completely green, some of them are going to be completely bronzed or brown, and then some of them are going to have leaf edge or leaf margin necrosis. Whenever I say necrosis, I mean death. Um, and you're, you can see this actually in, at any point in the growing season. You can see this start in September, you can see it in June. And that leaf cast is um, pretty complete. I found that on um, richer sites, on loamy soils, on northern red oaks, you actually get near 95% leaf cast from oak wilt. Whereas on a sandy site, you might not get 90% leaf cast. You might get, if a, if a northern pin oak on a very sandy site gets oak wilt, you might see that tree drop 60, 70 percent of its leaves, but then it's going to retain a significant portion of its leaves throughout the winter. This is also kind of um, not always stated in the, in the literature, and it also makes identifying oak wilt in sand country a little bit more challenging than on, say, a loamy site or a richer site. But you can see here, this is a northern red oak on, on, on a loam type soil, and it, it went from 50 percent <laughs> or 40 to 50 percent leaf wilt to nearly 100 percent leaf drop in about two weeks. That's pretty drastic. If you see that, you can almost be assured you have oak wilt. Um, oak wilt also spreads from tree to tree through roots. It actually spreads two ways, above ground and over ground. The insects carry it over land, basically almost up to a quarter mile, um, or slightly over a quarter mile. Um, but then also oak wilt spreads from tree to tree through grafted root systems. So you end up hitting these infection centers or mortality pockets. And, and that, that underground spread, it doesn't always happen in consecutive years because sometimes it takes that pathogen to get to the next tree several years. So you might, you might see disease spread anywhere from one to four years underground. And then on roughly a third of red oaks that get oak wilt, you'll have spore pad production, also known as pressure pads or fungal mats. These will form the fall or the spring after infection. And they have a fruity smell. Some people think they smell like red wine. Some people think they smell like a certain type of gum. I personally think they smell like bananas. But these, these spore pads are the, the things that, it, that attract the insects. And the insects fly to these. They pick up some spores, and they're also attracted to fresh wounds. And, and so that's how, um, whoops, where am I going here? So that's how um, the disease is transferred over now. Okay, the, th the, the last thing that oak wilt, or that northern, or that red oaks can get from oak wilt is what I call xylem streaking or vascular browning. Vascular browning on red oak, um, you would want to look on an actively wilting branch and not every single actively wilting branch is going to show vascular browning. In fact, I, I think it's, it's, it's not common to see vascular browning on red oak species, but you will see it. So if you see that vascular browning um, coupled with rapid leaf drop and almost complete leaf drop, you can be pretty assured that you have oak wilt. Okay, so oak wilt on oaks is it's not completely the same. You get quick, quick leaf drop, again, starting at the outer edge of the canopy. Um, and the leaf symptoms are similar. 
um, whereas you get that, that leaf edge browning, bronzing. I personally have found that kind of the basal portion of, of red oaks or of burr oaks kind of gets that marginal leaf browning before the distal portion. That's just been my experience. Um, and the, the difference, though, is that oak wilt doesn't necessarily kill burr oaks in a single growing season. It might take over three years to kill a burr oak. Um, I, have seen bur I have seen oak wilt kill burr oak on sandy sites, relatively small trees in a single growing season, so it does happen. And then you get the xylem streaking, too, in actively wilting branches. And in fact, this symptom is more common on burr oaks than it is on red oaks, in my experience. Now, I'm not going to cover white oaks. White oaks, the symptomology is, is very similar to white oak. The symptomology on white oaks is similar as it is on burr oaks. Okay, so just a little quiz. Um, what do you think this tree is showing? Do you think this tree has oak wilt? It's a northern red oak. Um, I believe I saw this tree. It was on a lake shore, cabin country. Um, and you can see from that bottom left picture that it, it cast a sizable portion of its leaves, 40%, very quickly. And in fact, it even had some marginal leaf browning. Weird thing is it had those spots. So what do you think? Oak wilt or not? I think the best answer is maybe. Um, or I think when I saw this tree back in my youth, when I was completely ignorant of all things, I, I think I said, I think this probably has oak wilt. But I was wrong. Um, what I did is I went back to that tree in three weeks, and the tree had not progressed in terms of leaf cast at all. It had just dropped 40% of its leaves, and it remained that way for the rest of the growing season. And if that happens on a northern red oak, you know it does not have oak wilt, because a red oak is going to die in one to two to three months from oak wilt. All right, so this tree, actually, that was a, a, an odd leaf disease called cylindral sporium. Um, and actually, Dr. Blanchett identified that for me because it was a big mystery to me for a while. My point in showing you guys this and gals out there is that there are lookalikes for oak wilt. So take caution. Lots of times it takes a couple site visits to, to be assured that it is oak wilt. Okay, let's talk a little bit about prevention. There was a fantastic um, research summary paper that Jenny Jeswick published in 1985. And it summarized 11 studies done in Minnesota looking at the efficacy of pruning to prevent oak wilt. And those studies, there were 11 studies that were done from the 50s through the 70s. And if you take an average um, on all those studies, you had a 25% reduction in new oak wilt centers from not pruning in May and June. But that is a drastic underestimate. I, I think because back in the 50s, they were studying some, um, they were studying the efficacy of prevention in some areas of the state that had almost no oak wilt. So the disease pressure was very low back in the 50s in certain areas. And so this, I, I, I would argue that your efficacy of preventing new oak wilt infections in May and June by not pruning is even greater than 25%, much greater in some years. Now, some people will say, well, you get natural damage, you know, you get windstorms, I might as well not prevent because Mother Nature is just going to wound my oaks. And I think, well, if you, if, you know, it's additive. So if you wound oaks and then Mother Nature wounds oaks, you're just going to have more wounds. Um, and, of course, you aren't guaranteed that a given oak stand is going to have severe wind damage in May and June to promote oak wilt. So um, prevention is effective. Um, in 2005, Jenny Doeswick and Angie Amborn um, corroborated all those previous observations um, in, a, in a fantastic study where they looked at the most common vectors of oak wilt. Most common vectors are two nidoduid species or sap beetles. 95% of the, of, the, of the insects that visit wounds in Minnesota are those nidoduid species. And here they looked at those species in this study, and they actually looked at the, the individual beetles that were visiting fresh wounds in, in the growing season for two growing seasons, and they looked at which ones were actually carrying the disease spores on their bodies. And as you can see by the relative heights of these bars, the, the, the riskiest periods or the, the periods in the year when these beetles are carrying the disease spores and visiting these fresh wounds is, is significantly greater in May and June. 
So prevention is effective. Um, this slide, I didn't really know where to put this slide, um, but I, I'll just tell you from my personal experience, um, for, for seven years in northern Wisconsin, I can tell you that firewood is a very common way that oak wilt moves across the landscape long distances. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I'll say this right now and I'll say it later. If um, property owners ask you out there in cyberspace land or you guys here in the audience, you know, how long can I move oak firewood? How long do I have to wait? The answer is wait, wait one year after the tree dies and then that, that firewood is not going to be infective or threatening to any old species anymore. Of course, you have to pay attention to quarantines, but just wait one year to move that firewood. Okay, I'm going to talk about management here, but before I do that, I want to show, um, let's just say this, is, this isn't worst case scenario of oak wilt. I've seen worse, but this is a pretty bad case of oak wilt on, on a scrub, scrub oak site in northwestern Wisconsin. This would be analogous to several sites north of the Twin Cities on the Anoka Sand Plain. And I've, cert I've outlined here in red all the oak wilt infection centers, and there are certainly more on this, just in this image that I didn't circle. I'm not going to talk about how to deal with oak wilt in this situation. And I, I'll be honest with you, I don't think I know how. Um, I'm not confident that oak wilt can be controlled in a situation like this. Um, I, I think it could be, but the amount of effort, time, and expenditures that would be required to control oak wilt in a sand like this are astronomical. So I'm not going to really talk about this. I'm going to talk about where you're dealing with one or two oak wilt pockets in a given stand. Um, I think in this situation here, um, y you know, you might be looking more at um, slow stand conversion or reduction of the oak density in a stand to reduce the future impact of oak wilt in that site. And I can tell you also in a, in a site like this, will, will, oak, will oaks regenerate? Yes, they will. But in all of these infection centers, they're going to regenerate from acorns rather than from stump sprouts if this site were to be harvested. Okay, so number one thing to do for oak wilt in your stand is you have to, man you have to monitor your forest. If you don't monitor your forest, you're going to miss new infections from, that are naturally caused, and oak wilt is going to, you know, is going to start killing more trees. Remember, it depend, if, if on a sandy site you have oak wilt, that disease is going to spread from tree to tree. It's going to spread radially at you know, 20 feet per year plus. And, and so it's crucial to monitor your forest and jump all over those infection centers when they get started. Here's another uh, kind of newly wilted. Well, this tree is pretty obvious to see. It's, it was wilted 50%. This tree here, it might be hard for you to see depending on your screen, but those leaves are just starting to bronze in mid-July. Mid That's oak wilt. That's, those are the initial symptoms. Okay, so what do you do if you have oak wilt? You first have to control the underground spread, then you have to control the above-ground spread, and then going into the future, you want to continue to prevent infection. All right, so how do you control the underground spread? Well, you've got several tools at your disposal. You have vibratory plows, you have trenchers, you have excavators, and then you have herbicides. Now, Herbicides, I will say, are not a proven method at controlling the underground spread of oak wilt. But there is a very promising technique that is being done in two locations in Wisconsin that I'm familiar with. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides here. But let's, let's just first look at vibratory plowing. What does that involve? That involves severing the rootgrass at least down to five feet deep around an infection center. And the key point here is that you have to, you don't want to plow a line. You can, you, you can see on your screens and in your offices where you're watching this that there's a secondary line business. I'm not going to talk about the secondary line business because it's the, that secondary line oftentimes fails. Um, I'm not saying it can't be done, but I'm just not going to talk about it today. There's not enough time. Um, so I'm going to be talking this whole time about putting the primary line in. If you hear uh, another kind of synonym for a primary line is like your, your definite line where, you wanna, where you're confident that you're going to stop oak wilt. And you want to place that primary line a considerable distance away from the, from the trees that are showing symptoms because oak wilt, remember, it spreads through those roots. And when you have an infected tree, it is probable 
depending on the time of year, that the actual oakal pathogen is actually well beyond that infected tree already. It might be several feet beyond, it might be tens of feet beyond that infected tree, possibly into a root graft, possibly into a neighboring tree. Oak wilt symptoms do not show, that they do not present themselves on oak trees until that pathogen gets into the above ground portion of the tree, into the trunk or branches. So you want to buffer that infection zone with healthy looking trees and plow around that zone. If you're using the excavator, now I'll go back to, to a vibratory plow. Vibratory plow will be appropriate if you have equipment availability, if you're on relatively flat ground, um, if there's room to move, maneuver between trees, um, if you have pretty deep soils. Uh, an excavator can be used on more remote sites um, when vibratory plow isn't available. Um, they use it on shallow and rocky soils on the, in the Schwamigan Nicolay National Forest in Wisconsin and on the Menominee Tribal Land in Wisconsin um, with pretty good success. An excavator has just about equal success as a vibratory plow, upwards of 90-95% success rate at controlling the underground spread of oakwood. And with the vibrant, with the excavator, you're just going to be popping out those, you're going to be cutting down the trees and then popping out the stumps. Okay, now with this herbicide method, this is not, I'm not going to be talking about um, cut stump, fresh cut stump surface application. Um, people do do that, and in fact, it's quite common to do, to try and limit the underground spread. Um, but there's been no um, systematic and recorded observations done on those that type of um, control in the upper in the upper Midwest, and I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about this double frill girdle method, and I will just say this method is promising, but you can't just go out and do it. You have to get a protocol because they've tried different variations of this method throughout the country, and it it usually has failed. But with this specific protocol that they're using, um, you'd want to follow this and you'd want to let someone know so they could document it. And I just heard that Wisconsin DNR is getting a grant to actually kind of systematically record their observations on the study. So um, stay tuned and it's looking pretty good. But what this involves is it involves double throw girdle in early July of the, those barrier trees when they're living and applying a systemic you know, herbicide like, like Garlon. And then leaving those trees die, they'll die in a couple weeks. And then coming back in the fall to utilize that wood. That's the, the basic protocol. Again, keep in mind that's experimental. You want to let someone know or, or get the protocol at the very least before you do it. Okay, so that was all the above, the below ground spread. You got to control the above ground spread too. Um, and here are the texts for doing that. Let me turn off my alarm. I know I'm going too long now. Um, you can burn that infected wood. You can chip it. You can bark it. You can process it into lumber. You can target. You want to do all of those things before the following April because that's when the, these, this infected wood is going to sporulate, at least a third of it. Now, I will say, too, if you're dealing with white oaks or bur oaks, you don't really need to mess, worry about this step because sporulation on those trees, on bur oaks, it does happen, but infrequently. And on white oaks, I think it may have been observed in the country once. So it is extremely rare. It essentially doesn't happen on white oaks. So this, this step here is for dealing with the red oaks group. Now, there are certain situations where um, you're, de you're um, dealing with oak wilt in a um, mixed species stand, so, you know, red maples, basswoods, red oaks. In that situation, you might have the opportunity to simply remove all the hosts that are going to, um, that, are, that are growing next to one another and are likely root grafted, and just remove them, and then you just put the kibosh on your oak wilt infection center right there. Okay, I mentioned this before, I mentioned it again. At the very least, don't move that, that firewood. If you, keep, if you have no means of getting rid of the wood, just don't move it for a year. And you're at least, you know, you aren't getting rid of the overland infection spread from your property, but at least you aren't moving it to a different property. At least you aren't moving it across the landscape long distance. And I mentioned this too, you want to continue to prevent oak wilt into the future. And this picture here, the, the, the trunk on the right, that's just a shot of a, it was a clear cut done, um, and it left roughly like six, six red oaks per acre. It was a pretty decent quality site, and it was, it was clear cut in June. And it, um, that wound that you can see is from uh, a tree that fell on that residual and scraped off the bark. 
This was done in June, and the nearest known oak wilt infection center was 25 miles away. This tree died two months later. So, just a warning. If, like, and this goes back to what I said before. If you have oak wilt in an area, um, you should assume you actually have much more oak wilt than is what is known. Um, I'll touch on this very briefly. Oak wilt can be prevented with propiconazole. Um, which is a fungicide. Propiconazole is the, is the active ingredient of fungicide. Fungicides generally, they work great, um, but they do not stop the underground disease spread. It's key to know. Um, and they need to be done every two years. They're, they can be effective as a therapeutic treatment on a, on a previously infected white oak or bur oak. But generally, um, you'd want to inject those trees earlier in the, inf in the um, symptom game than later. And you should, I highly recommend um, hiring an experienced professional to do the injections. So that's all I'm going to say about injections. I already talked about this, and I'm kind of getting short on time on the oak, on the oak wilt segment. But this is ideally what you would do if you found oak wilt in your, in your landscape. You put in the sever, sever line with the vibratory plow. Um, now, I, I just want to bring this up. There, there has been great research done in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan where they have quantified um, the size of oaks and how far away they can graft to one another on sandy soils. I know a lot of folks in Minnesota are very much against using data from that study. Um, but all I'm saying is, if you don't have much experience controlling oak wilt, but you're going to try and tackle it on your own, I highly recommend you, you read a publication like this um, that, that will, that will um, illustrate in what situations oaks root graft to each other and, and at what rate and at, how, at what distance. These are great publications to review. And I think Matt can provide a link to that one online. So after you put in that vibratory plow line, then you would want to remove, cut to the line, the healthy looking oaks. Again, I'm not talking about secondary line here. I'm, I'm telling you what I think is the most effective long-term solution to control an local infection center. I recommend sacrificing those trees for the good of the rest of the forest. Um, and then I recommend herbiciding their stumps because you want, to, you want to prevent them from suckering, which would keep part of the root system alive. You want to starve that root system so that the oak wilt pathogen eventually dies out in that root system before, the, before roots regraft across that barrier line. And then you want to deal with the disease wood, which I covered. Here are some great publications to review for oak wilt. Um, that one on the right is a USDA Forest Service, um, very comprehensive publication on oak wilt. Um, the top left one is a publication from UW, University of Wisconsin Extension, and that bottom left one is from Michigan State University Extension. And both those extension pubs cover <coughs> root grafting in pretty good detail. And I recommend re reviewing them. Okay, on to burr oak plant, also known as Bob. Here's a picture of what burr oak light can do to a burr oak tree. And this, this is pretty severe disease in, um, infection there. Now, in contrast to oak oil, the genetic evidence that has been um, looked at for the burrow blight pathogen strongly suggests that it is native to the eastern United States. And also, when you take a look at host resistance of the burrow, of to burrow blight in um, our burrows, there's a lot of natural resistance or natural disease tolerance, which also suggests that this is a native pathogen. Also, when you took a look, take a look at the distribution of bur oak blight, it is pretty much known for the entire, it is pretty much present for the entire range of bur oak in the state of Minnesota. And surveys were only, um, were only started in a kind of a systematic way in 2010. So bur oak blight is spread throughout our state. And like I, like I briefly mentioned before, bur oak blight only infects some of our bur oaks, and in fact, it only infects a certain variety of our bur oaks, the, the variety oliviformis, 
and that is the small acorn variety of burl. And I will disclose right now that I'm definitely not an oak taxonomist. And I know in the early 90s, there was a debate amongst oak taxonomists whether bur oaks actually have varieties or if they're hybrids. I know one botanist at law at least thought that this variety was actually a hybrid, a hybrid between bur oaks and white oaks. Um, but I'm just, again, I'm not a, an oak taxonomist, so I'm just sticking with what the, what the main bur oak blight researcher talked about in his paper. And he talked about this variety of oliviformis as the susceptible variety. Now there's a variety, Macrocarpa, that's the big acorn variety of Baroque. And my understanding, don't quote me on this, is that that variety is not very well represented, if at all, in the state of Minnesota. There are, our, our variety, by far, is this oliviformis variety. Okay. Now I mentioned you have variable susceptibility with Baroque blight, which is great news. Um, and this is in great contrast to Oakwell. You can see on um, that upper right bur oak, that's clearly a bur oak. I wasn't sure about the green tree to the right of the blighted tree. I'm not sure if that's a bur oak or not, but, I, but clearly that one in the upper right is a bur oak. And this is quite common with bur oak blight on our landscape. You'll have a severely infected bur oak right next to a bur oak that doesn't show any disease at all or very limited disease. This again suggests that there's a strong genetic tolerance or resistant component in our burrow population. Okay, so what are the symptoms of burrow blight? It starts off with what I call leaf vein flecking on the underside of leaf or um, vein death. Um, also, whenever I say necrosis, that means tissue death. So that's the initial um, symptom. That, and you might see that in June if you're really paying attention and looking close. But, you know, from a, from a, a ways away, you aren't going to notice this symptom on your burrows. Now, you'll also get, eventually, and typically in late July, early August, last year was early August that I noticed, you get wedge-shaped leaf necrosis forming or whole leaf necrosis. And you'll also, around this time, start getting pretty rapid leaf drop, similar to oak wilt. But with oak wilt, you don't get those, that wedge necrosis shape. And if you get this wedge necrosis shape, this is a very strong um, diagnostic feature of bur oak blight. I just mentioned you get that leaf drop. Now, what I didn't mention is you get leaf drop from the inner canopy proceeding outward. Like you can see this, this broke on the left, the upper part of its canopy is completely green, but the inner part is blighted or, and lost a lot of its leaves. Again, whenever you see that, you know it's some kind of fungal leaf disease. And in this case, it's, it's burrow blight. Now, you also get a portion of the leaves retained in the canopy. In fact, there's one right off of St. Paul campus that has kind of scattered dead leaves in the canopy. Now I will say, if you're driving around Minnesota in the wintertime and you're looking at the bur oaks and you see some bur oaks like this, you can't be assured that they have bur oak blight. I mean, you know, if a, if a bur oak dies from oak wilt from two-line chest on border, it's going to retain a portion of the leaves in the canopy. But it does happen with bur oak blight. Now when you take a look at the bases, the, the, the leaf stems or petioles, of those leaves that are retained in the upper canopy throughout the winter, you probably are going to notice some black pustules on swollen leaf petioles. Now that is a very good diagnostic for identifying baroque blight. Um, and and some, of the, some, of the, some of the leaves will actually snap off their petiole base, the, the, but the petiole will remain. Okay, and I already mentioned this as another uh, helpful diagnostic feature to identify baroque blight. Okay. There are many other fungi that cause black spots on petioles of burrow blight. So don't con get confused. Whatever caused these black blotches on, on burrow leaves last year was quite common. But that's not burrow blight. This is. The burrow blight um, are pustules, or they're like little black pimples that erupt out of the epidermis of the petiole. Okay. So. And also keep in mind those, those petioles get swollen with burrow blight. All right, so if burrow blight is a native pathogen, why has it gotten so much press recently? Well, it's likely that um, it has increased in population because of favorable spring conditions. Here's a shot. This, 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 um, 
image comes from Skip, the Skip website. Is that right? S C I P P Southern Climate Something Something Something. It's a fantastic website for looking at climate data, temperature and precipitation. You can look at any month in the year. You can look at any season in the year. And here I'm looking at the the seasonal spring precipitation for central Minnesota since 1895. The, that, the middle bar that divides the two different colors is the long-term average. And the, the colored, the colored um, curves are, that's a long-term moving average. But you can also see what you got for totals with these, the boxes, which are connected by the lines. So if you, if you zoom in on um, that graph on the very right, since 2000, you can see that there is there were two there was only one period in in that time frame where there were two consecutive springs that saw below average precipitation okay um, and actually in Iowa where broke blight was was first identified I believe and it's kind of the center of broke blight research they have not had two consecutive below average wet springs since I believe 1993 so consecutive wet springs equal leaf disease, and if you continue to get those consecutive wet springs, the population is going to increase, increase, increase. Okay, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to start to talk about management here, but, but it's going to be in a little while. But I want to start off with this slide. So birds with severe bob for several consecutive years can die from secondary organisms. Keep in mind that burrow blight is a late season defoliator. A late season defoliator does not put as much stress on a tree as an early season defoliator because with late season defoliations you do not, the trees don't reflush, which is, which is um, energy consumptive. It takes a lot of energy to reflush. With, with burrow blight that doesn't happen. So you can, you know, these trees look horrible, but they're going to reflush the next year and the next year. But at some point, they, you know, they're, they are losing um, energy reserves that they presumably would use to put into required root growth the following spring. So it's so they're they're going to be weakened. At some point they're probably going to be attacked by armal area and or two lane chestnut borer. We can't forget the commonness of two lane chestnut borer. This is a very common native pathogen or excuse me, native insect pest of oaks. Um, and it's very abundant on the landscape. Um, it and it causes branch death starting usually at the outer part of the crown, and it'll kill an oak anywhere from in one to three years. Tip, tip, one, one year um, death induced by two-line chest and is quite, quite rare. It can happen in severe drop years. But anyways, you know, on the landscape, um, I don't know if you guys can see this on your computer screens, but I put a dot over all the trees that are showing um, branch flagging from two-line chest and board. And you can see this is a very abundant organism in, during certain years in, on the landscape. And um, again, back to this phenomenal weather website, if you take a look at our late summer precipitation levels, for example, in south central Minnesota, where I've seen a lot of, of scattered death induced by armillary and two-line chestnut borer, when you take a look at um, droughts in our late summer, they, they've been quite common recently. And in fact, I think that the, the bottom most point there is a record for August precipitation level. It was the least amount of precipitation ever recorded in, in South Central Minnesota. And that same pattern can be seen in Central, um, East Central and Southeast Minnesota. I'll mention this really quick. The same fungicide active ingredient that prevents oak wilt death or symptomology will also hammer back bur oak blight. But you only want to treat an oak if it had baroque blight for several consecutive years. Because remember, even though the tree looks horrible, it's probably not going to die until it's been impacted by baroque blight severely for several years. And a single spring treatment is going to be effective for many years on, on a baroque. You don't need to in, inject a given baroque at the frequency to prevent baroque blight that you would at, with oak wool, for example. And you want to use a low label rate because burrow blight is quite sensitive in a phytotoxic manner to propaconsol. So I believe that is it's like 10 mils per, per liter per inch diameter, something like that. Okay, back to this comment because I'm going to talk about management of forest. Keep this in mind. Most burrows are resistant or tolerant to bob. 
So, yeah, if you're out there marking a stand um, with sing single tree selection or thinning it or group selection, you really don't need to think about Baroque blight because you, you're going to remove the trees naturally that are susceptible to Baroque blight anyways because their crowns are going to look crappy. So, um, you know, in, in a stand, at this point, all I recommend is removing the trees that are highly susceptible to Baroque blight, and in that way you're going to increase the overall genetic resistance of your Baroque population to Baroque blight. We have a few minutes here to review quickly the differences in a side-by-side -side comparison. So again, with Baroque blight, the disease progresses from the inner canopy outward, which is in great contrast to oak wilt, where the disease progresses from the outer part of the canopy inward. All right, do a self quiz here, silently to yourselves. Which tree do you think is showing symptoms of burrow blight? The one on the left. It's got those that wedge-shaped leaf necrosis that is very diagnostic for burrow blight. Um, and here is another picture of that wedge-shaped leaf necrosis. Even though it's coming on that picture on the left, even though it's it's coming from the tip of the leaf inward, it's still you can see it's bounded by those leaves which is in contrast to oak wilt symptoms. And then, of course, um, you get that leaf vein flecking, too, in the early season with Baroque blight. Now, I will tell you that just because you have Baroque blight on a tree doesn't mean that that tree does not have oak wilt. And it doesn't mean also that that tree doesn't have two-line chestnut board. Just because you have a tree with oak wilt doesn't mean that it also does not have two-line chestnut board. I frequently see two-line chestnut board galleries on trees that are impacted by oak wilt. And I'm talking about northern red oaks. So be really careful. Um, take your time when, you, when you're diagnosing these issues because it is complicated. Oftentimes it is not a slam dunk. I've seen, I've seen last year I saw near Cannon Falls, I saw a tree with oak wilt and pearl blight. Okay, um, if you see the xylem streaking on a wilting branch, that's a very good diagnostic feature for oak wilt, especially if it's coupled with rapid and nearly complete leaf drop. And then with Baroque blight, don't forget that it produces those black pimples or pustules on the swollen leaf petioles. Doesn't happen with oak wilt. Remember that oak wilt kills moose underground and creates these infection centers. Don't forget about this publication. It's a phenomenal publication. And I will take questions at that point and reserve the quiz I have. Great. Well, thank you, Brian, for, uh, for that primer on oak wilt and burrow flight. Both two diseases are uh, very much of interest to us here in Minnesota. Uh, I'll encourage folks uh, that are online to uh, type any questions they have into the chat box. Um, so that would be on the right-hand side of the uh, web conferencing tool. Um, if you see it highlighted in red, um, you might just click on it to maximize it, um, and then you'll be able to type questions, um, and then we can relay them to Brian. Uh, here in St. Paul. Um, one question, Ryan, coming from online, uh, is there no chance of burrow blight spreading through root grafts? There is no chance of burrow blight spreading through root grafts because those black pustules um, form the spores. And if, the, if those leaves, you know, like I said, you get some leaf retention in the, in the canopy, those leaves typically are the ones that produce those, those black pustules on the leaf petioles. And then if you get really moist spring conditions, those pustules form the spores that get rain splashed and spread all over the canopy and the tree. Um, there, there's actually a, a different type of spore that is also produced on leaves um, at a different time of the year that aids in secondary infections, which build up the population if, if wet conditions persist. But Baroque blight is not a systemic pathogen. The, the, the actual pathogen is not in the the xylem vessels of the tree were the flown. And another one coming uh, from our Grand Rapids uh, broadcast site. Uh, do you think that folks in northern Minnesota should adopt pruning practices that are in place in central <laughs> and southern Minnesota? Oh boy, that's a controversial question. It's really not my place to say. Who asked that question? <laughs> um, I'll tell you what, let's I wonder if I could skip my slide back here. A little bit. You know, I showed that map, that distribution map of oak wilt with all the red dots 
on that distribution map, I failed to say that it also shows this, this light gray flecking, which represents the, the range, the model range of red oaks in the state of Minnesota. And red oaks, like I said before, they're the ones where this disease is very impactful. Um, in all honesty, no, I don't, I don't think um, prevention should be, needs to be taken out in the Grand Rapids area. But then, you know, it does get really tricky to make recommendations as the presence of oak wilt gets closer and closer. Oak wilt can move naturally, typically up to, it's like 600 meters, they've shown that these beetles will fly. You know, 90% of them only probably fly 100 yards. But they, they will, they have been shown to fly up to 600 meters, and certainly some of them will fly further, prop, further but that percentage will be extremely small. So any, any oak wilt within a quarter mile of your stand is greatly threatening to any oaks. So at, at the very least, if you have oak wilt within a quarter mile, I highly recommend not wounding oaks in any way, whether that be through harvesting or whether that is through um, pruning or trees. trees. Um, but clearly oak wilt moves um, further than that quarter mile. It, you know, I've seen it move. I, I've seen it, in fact, the one stand 25 miles away from our, our nearest known infection center, and I was looking hard for it in that area. Oak wilt is very difficult to identify from the air over a mixed species forest or where it, it just hasn't been established for very long. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a point to debate. What, at what distance away from an, a known oak wilt infection center should um, people start um, minimizing wounding during that critical period. You know, another thing to say with that, with that question is that wounding trees in, in that period, May and June, April, typically it's not a good idea to do that anyways because their bark is loose, it's full of moisture, and you know, anytime you get wood exposure from any wound whatsoever, not only does it make on an oak, not only does it make that oak susceptible to oak wilt if, if oak wilt is nearby, but it also makes that tree susceptible for as long as that wound is open to um, decay fungi. And decay fungi, they, you know, there are multiple species. We're probably breeding in decay fungal spores right here in this room in St. Paul. Um, you can't get away from those spores. So that's something else to consider with, you know, other wounding agents to, um, to trees. And, you know, like talk about sugar maple. If you get wounds, particularly in, in the late spring, early summer, uh, on the basal portions of sugar maples, you can get a vascular disease called sap streak disease. And I've seen sap streak disease do some significant damage to um, stands. Typically, that's, that's a problem where there's sugar maple tapping going, tapping going on. Uh, another question from Scott. He's wondering if you can pick sort of one day on the calendar to maybe do a walk through your woods um, to monitor for new oak wilt um, cases that you might find. Uh, what might be a particular date that you might recommend? July 4th. July 4th. July 4th, yep. Yep. I, I think, um, and may, maybe in even like north of Grand Rapids, if you're in oak country, I, I, um, or northwest, you know, the, the, kind of the northern central part of the state where there is still a significant portion of northern red oaks, you might even want to wait until the end of July to do it or early August. But I think in, in north of the Twin Cities, July 4th is a great time to start scouting for oak wilt because that's the time of the year when I've started seeing symptoms be quite noticeable. You know, in, in southern Minnesota, maybe you, want to, maybe you want to go later June, but I think around that July 4th period, that's a great time to scout for oak wilt symptoms. And another one from Gary Wyatt, if you're planting or you're planning to plant oaks in windbreaks or conservation plantings, uh, what species do you recommend? And is there a revised spacing recommendation, 15, 20, 30 feet? Um, your thoughts about sort of planting oaks in windbreaks? Um, I think that if you're able to diversify the windbreak, windbreak planting to do so, um, because I know at, at the very least that pines of similar species root graft and oaks of similar species root graft. The rate of root graft root grafting on burrows apparently is lower than it is in, in red oaks. I know there is some research done in the central sands of Wisconsin um, 
several decades ago that looked at the rate of root grafting in burrows, and I believe they found it was 3% of the species root grafted together. But I, I caution people in taking that number as a definite number because when you take a look at various root grafting species that have been done in the country um, on, sim on the same species, they typically come up with widely different, differing numbers. Um, but it is likely that bur oaks and white oaks root graft at a lower rate than red oaks. So to answer the question, I would personally favor white oaks and bur oaks over northern red oaks, but ideally you'd plant red oaks, white oaks, and bur oaks on the same planting. Um, you know, for any leaf disease, presumably um, you're going to get less leaf disease spread if you diversify your planting. And oak will definitely is going to be a more uh, more devastating disease if you all if you go with just one species in a row. I also mentioned with pines, red pines, you can see um, with red pine windbreaks all over the state, all over the region, you can see um, root pathogens mowing down areas of red pine. And if those red pines would have been um, if those windbreaks would have been diversity, diversified, presumably the, the life of the windbreak would be greater. I, man, I, these answers are way too long. I've got to shorten my answers. Jeez. I think they're perfect. They're giving us all the content that we yes, want. I guess. Um, one question, uh, how much of a difference does painting oak wounds uh, have in preventing oak growth? So I'm glad that lack after pruning. I'm really glad whoever asked that question asked that question um, because Yes, if you if a if an oak is, is wounded, say in a in a spring spring windstorm, um, or if it's if it's got to be pruned, I've I've actually dealt with property owners whose insurance companies have, um, in a way, forced them um, to to prune their oaks in the spring because of some reason I wasn't familiar with. But yes, if you have to prune in May and June, April, May, June, July, actually the entire growing season, if we're talking an ornamental tree, you should paint that wound with a with a latex based paint. Because that latex-based paint, I've read I've read different reasonings for why that prevents the the disease infection. But basically, it either blocks the vectors from actually landing and um, depositing the spores. So it actually forms as a physical block, or it suppresses the the um, the volatile chemicals that attract the sap beetles to that one. So yes, if if you can if you can. If you can, um, if you have to prune in the growing season, definitely put a latex based, based paint on that one to prevent oak wilt. And and if you you know if you, if you have wind wind damage, um, prune prune that wind damaged branch off with with a, with an appropriate pruning cut and then apply that latex based paint. Uh, maybe switching gears a little bit to bur oak blight now. Um, so bur oak blight is a native pathogen, but how long do you think it's been here in Minnesota? Um, and does the wet spring really explain the majority of the rise in bur oak blight that we've seen? Great question. Um, my predecessor, times twice removed, um, started reporting increased leaf disease on bur oak, I believe, in the early 90s. And I believe Jill Pocorny, who worked at the University of Minnesota Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic in the late 80s reported getting um, symptomatic um, leaves that she thought were probably, now she thinks they, it turns out they were probably burrow blight. It's just that no one was doing any research on, on it at that point. And I know a lot of people talked, you know, back in the 90s, I think they would attribute um, the burrow blight to anthracnose, which is another, um, it's, it's another group of of fungal leaf diseases, but anthracnose, generally the, the, the most severe symptoms show up in, in the spring or early summer, whereas with burrow blight, those symptoms show up in the later summer. But anyways, it, it, burrow blight, the rise in burrow blight population was, according to the people that are in the know, it, it may have been in the late 80s. Now in terms of the question, do I really think if, if um, increased precipitation in the spring is due to the rise in burrow blight, I, it's the best reason that I've heard of from researchers. So yeah, they, they've convinced me. And you know, if if we hear of if we hear of any other research-based information that can explain the rise in broke light, we will certainly communicate that in our in our newsletter. Maybe as we're wrapping up, just another final question or two. Um, going back to Oakwell, how long should you wait after Oakwell? 
infestation, say in Red Oak, um, before you plant the same species in the same location, uh, we recommend possibly doing other management approaches. If you really want to plant an oak species in an oak wilt infection center that is identical to the oak species that died from oak wilt, I'd wait six years. Because, um, in, in, in all honesty, um, the only reason I say that is because I know that, you know, in, in forest pathology textbooks, where, when they talk about the oak wilt pathogen, they talk about how it can be in the root system alive in these root systems without, you know, spreading to another tree and, and showing symptoms. It can survive for at least four years. And I believe somewhere in my mind I have six, six years in my mind for um, the oak wilt pathogen being, being able to remain in the root system. So I would wait that amount. But having said that, it's unlikely that a planted oak would, would, would root graft. Um, you know, if you waited four years, it's unlikely that it would root graft just in two years to an established root system that has the pathogen. But I, you know, having said all that, if, if, if the site conditions are favorable for planting a different oak species or a different species altogether, I might go with that route too. I might steer away from, the, from might do a little crop rotation. And then a final question on, on oak wilt management. Uh, could you use an air spade uh, to effectively stop root grafting um, in oak wilt? Interesting question. I have had the privilege or not the privilege to work with an air spade on a limited basis a couple, three times. Um, and I don't think, I mean, you know, how we were using that air spray, it was just being used to um, kind of disperse the sandy soils and it wasn't used to cut the roots. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not familiar with an air spade actually being able to cut roots, but if it can, I don't, under, I don't know why it couldn't be used to sever the roots, as long as you could do that five feet below the soil surface at least. So I, you know, I'm, I'm more of a fan, you know, in industrial, large-scale timber sale operations where vibratory plows are not available, I'm in favor of using the stump extraction method with the, with the excavator to disrupt the root systems, as long as invasive plants are a big concern on that site because obviously you're exposing a lot of bare mineral soil and it's highly disturbing to the site. But you can incorporate those costs of using that excavator into a timber sale and still make a profit. It just reduces the profit. Very good. Yes. Well, we're coming up on the hour, I just wanted to thank Ryan uh, from our online community and from folks here in St. Paul and um, at our other broadcast sites. Um, if you take a look at the chat pod, there's some links that might be of interest to a lot of the documentation that Brian mentioned, a lot of the management guides and uh, sort of uh, diagnosing these different diseases, so I'd encourage you to take a look at those. Um, and also in terms of next month uh, for our Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative um, and University of Minnesota Extension webinars, uh, April 21st, um, we'll be talking about the Minnesota Forest Management Guidelines um, and how to be prepared and sort of um, learning about some new revisions to those. Um, and so everybody, I thank Brian for his presentation to us today, and we'll say so long uh, to everyone online.